What a wonderful song, amen. If you have your Bibles this morning, I'd ask you to stand with me. If you would, repeat after me. This is my Bible. It is God's holy word. It's a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. And I will hide its words within my heart that I might not sin against God. Amen. You may be seated. If you would be finding Matthew chapter 1, verse 18, Matthew chapter 1, verse 18, as we continue through the gospel journey, we have made it to the point of Christ's birth, Christ's birth. And I know Christmas has come and gone, and on the calendar anyway, but the birth of Christ is something that, that can be celebrated and should be celebrated more than just on Christmas Day. Uh, so I'm excited for the message today, and you know, many people talk about Christmas in July. We're going to have Christmas in February. Is that okay? Yeah. Um, also, what better time to talk about the birth of Christ than right before Valentine's Day? The greatest act of love ever known to man and giving us his very own son uh, right before Valentine's Day. And men, that is a hint, if you have not already got your presents you need to do so before the 14th, okay? Uh, but I've preached over this text several times. As you can imagine, Christmas comes and goes each year. A uh, series of messages leading up to Christmas, on Christmas, after Christmas. Uh, I've been preaching for about 15 years now, so I've been over this text several times. But uh, I have to say, I don't think I've ever preached it like I'm about to do so today. Uh, God just opened my eyes this week and allowed me to see something that I have never seen before. And the spectacular thing is that it's, it's not a deep theological hidden truth. It's something very plain, very simple right in the text and just something that I've, I've failed to see up until this week. And so uh, don't you love when that happens? When you go back to a text that you feel like you're very comfortable with and you've read and studied time and again and God just opens your eyes to, to more truth, not a different truth, just a deeper truth of what's already there. Praise God for it. So today, that's what we're going to look at. And the aim of the text today, I feel, is to show the power of God. More specifically, it shows how powerful the testimony of Jesus can be. The testimony of Jesus. And that's the title of our message today, the testimony of of Jesus. A testimony is an account. It is the account of one's life. When you give your testimony, you're simply telling others the account of your life. Who you were, what happened, what changed you, how God came into your life, and who you are now. That is a testimony. It is your story. It is your personal story. It's unique to you. And when we tell our story, we're not only giving others a glimpse of who we are, we're giving others a glimpse of who God is and how he changed our life. That is a testimony. And so God is a part of our story. Matter of fact, God is the main part of our story. He is the purpose of our story. And the good thing is, is that when we see the testimony of Jesus, not only is God a part of our story, but we are a part of his story. We are a very main part of the testimony of Jesus. So as we see the testimony of Jesus in this text, we're going to see the power that it has to change lives. The power it has to change lives. So Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. If you got it, say, I got it. All right. It says, now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife. 
For that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took to him his wife and did not know her until she had brought forth her firstborn son and he called his name Jesus. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for this tremendous act of love. We thank you for sending your son Jesus to us. Not only that he would be with us, but he would be for us. That he came for his people. Thank you for your love. Father, I pray today your spirit would take control of this place. That it would lead and guide in the message, but it would also fill the hearts of every person in this room. So that we might feel your presence and know of this amazing love that we just read about. Thank you, Father, for loving us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so to set a little bit of context, the last time that we looked at Mary and Joseph, a couple of weeks ago, they had been through a fight, nonetheless. Mary comes up pregnant. Joseph is really struggling with the fact that his espoused wife is pregnant, knowing that it's not his child, and naturally speaking, they had a fight. And the fight was bad enough that Joseph said, you know what, I just don't think I can do this. And so Joseph walks away. Joseph decides not to carry on with the engagement. And they temporarily, if you want to call it, break up. So Mary follows up with a lead that Gabriel had given to her that Elizabeth was pregnant. And so she travels to Elizabeth's house and spends about three months with them. And John the Baptist is born. And we looked at that last week. And And then Mary comes back. But while Mary leaves, something goes on with Joseph. And it says there in uh, uh, verse 20, But while he thought about these things, even though Joseph had made the decision to follow not follow through on the engagement, he still couldn't stop thinking about Mary. He loved Mary. I mean, otherwise, why would they be engaged, right? I mean, it was a relationship that, that was, was very deeply rooted. I mean, uh, if he didn't love Mary, then he simply would have cast her aside, went and found another woman, and carried on with life. But, I mean, Joseph, using modern-day terms, had been lit, bitten by the love bug. I mean, he was serious about Mary, and he really loved her. And the, he, could, he just couldn't stand the fact that Mary had cheated on him, gotten pregnant by another man, and, and then was trying to explain it away by using this miraculous story of, of God giving her a child and that she really was faithful. And he just couldn't take all that. And so he ends up deciding to leave Mary. Now notice the reason for the separation. The reason that, that he pulls away from Mary is because of Jesus. She is pregnant with a baby who we know to be Jesus, and because of that, Joseph says, you know what, I got to go. It's not my child. (laughs) I know it's not my child, and you're pregnant with a baby that's not mine. I got to leave. And maybe there's some here today who have, have been struggling with that same thing in your own relationship. Maybe your wife loves Jesus, but you're just not completely sold yet. And you've been pondering the idea, you know what, If you want to have all this Jesus stuff, that's fine, but I just don't think I can do it. Or maybe the roles are reversed, and maybe your husband loves Jesus and constantly brings you to church, and you're just like, you know what, I love you, but if it's it's going to be like this and we're going to have to have all this Jesus stuff, I just don't know that I can take that. I I don't know that I can do that. I mean, it was because of Jesus that Joseph steps away. But miraculously, by the time we get to the end of the story, God, through an angel, gives Joseph the testimony of Jesus Christ. And after hearing his testimony, Joseph changes his mind. 
And so as we go through the text today, I want you to listen to the testimony of Jesus. I want you to hear his story and how his story is so focused on you and has a love for you that hopefully it will change your mind about Jesus. Amen? All right. The first thing we want to look at today is the purpose of Jesus. The purpose of Jesus. Look at verse 21. It said, And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now, Joseph, as we already know, is struggling with this, and so God sends an angel and says, Joseph, hold up. You need to understand some things about this baby before you make this decision. And I know you love her, otherwise, you know, you wouldn't still be thinking about her and crying over her and all, you wouldn't be moping around. You really love this girl, and I don't want to see a good thing in, so let me give you some information about this baby before you decide to walk away. And the first thing you need to understand about him is why he's here. You need to understand the purpose of this baby. And it gives us the purpose in, in the name. It says she, is born, she has a child, and, and she's going to bear a son, and she's going to call his name Jesus. Now, Jesus literally means he who will save his people from their sins. That's what Jesus means. That's why we call him the Savior, because he has come to save his people from their sins. In other words, what he's telling Joseph, now it doesn't say it in this text, it doesn't break it all the way down, but Joseph being a Jew and growing up with the word of God, he would have understood all this. He, he knew the, the text and, and he knew what the word of God said. But the angel's telling him, this is the prophesied Messiah. This is the one that, that we've been talking about for years and years and years. The one who is going to come and deliver his people. And Jesus is going to come and save his people from their sins. And you need to understand something, Joseph. The people need Jesus to come. The people need Jesus. Joseph, all too well, you know what the people is like. You live in Jerusalem. You are a Jew. You know how far that we have fallen from the true word of God. You know what the nation looks like. You know how far we have left from the original meaning of the word. You know how corrupt things have gotten. You know what the world looks like. You see the corrupted religious system. You, you know what it's like to pay taxes that are unfair. And, and you know what it's like to, to pick and choose laws that you're going to follow one day and something different the next day. You, you see that we need a Savior. Not only that, you're oppressed by the Romans and, and all, this, all this oppression and you're having to do things that you don't feel is right. We need a Savior. We need Savior to come. And not only that, apart from the corrupted religious system and apart from the, the rule of the Romans, look at the sinfulness of the people. We need a deliverer. We need a conqueror. We need someone to come back and preach truth and get us back on the right path and get us back into the grace of God. Go back and read the word. You've seen it all too many times where Israel would love God one generation and the next generation they would fall away. And the next generation they would love him again and the next generation they would fall away. And we're in a dry season. For 400 years you've not heard anything from me. And now I'm sending you Jesus my son. And he is going to set crooked paths straight. And he is going to set the captives free. He is going to deliver those who are oppressed. And he is going to lift up those who have been broken down. He is going to make things right again. The people need Jesus. Jesus needs to come. Not only do the people need Jesus, but Jesus wants to come. He wants to be here. Look at what it said again in verse 21. And you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save whose people? People. He said he's coming for his people. He's coming for his people. He wants to be here. He loves his people. The sin of mankind has left us in a fallen state and God created us for more than that. God created us to be better than that. 
God created us to be conquerors. And so Jesus is coming for his people. You say, no, wait a minute, pastor, I'm confused because I thought Jesus died for all people. Don't misunderstand. The blood of Jesus Christ is powerful enough to save every man, woman, and child that God has ever created. But the application of the only be applied to those who believe. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth should not perish but have everlasting life. We, we, we can't teach some type of universalist theory to where every person is going to heaven because the Bible makes it clear many will not go there. Those who will go there will be those who believe in the name of the Son of God and believe that he came to set his people free and believe that he is God in the flesh and that he died for their sins and rose the third day by the power of God and stands as a conqueror and sits on the right hand of God making intercession for them. Those who believe in that will be saved. That's why he came. To save his people. Are you his people? Are you a child of God? That's the question you've got to wrestle with. Because Jesus loves you. He came to you. He gladly gave his life for you. Even those who crucified him on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them for they don't understand what they're doing. He even loved them. He loved everybody, but he's not going to force you to love him back. That's the testimony of Jesus, is that his purpose was to seek and to save that which was lost. Luke 19, 10. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. That's why he's here. That's why Mary's pregnant. Because she's bringing forth a Messiah that is going to change the course of history. He's about to turn the world upside down. Let me tell you something. If you say you're saved and Jesus didn't turn your world upside down, you might want to seek out God in your life. When you get bit by the love bug of God, when God comes into your life and you feel the love of his almighty hand on you and you realize the depth of that love over your life, it doesn't matter what comes, whether the, the, the rains and the floods rise or the winds come crashing through, it doesn't matter what happens, you will be secure in the hand of Jesus. It will turn your life upside down. You can't help but to love him back. You can't help but to love him. Once you understand the love of God, it changes your life. And our purpose as a child of God is to be a part of his purpose. And his purpose was to seek and to save that which was lost. Everyone who believes in the purpose of God will ask this question, God, how may I be of, how may I be of service? How can I help? What can I do to further accomplish your will? Where do I fit in your plan? God, you love me that much. I'll gladly give my life to you. That's the purpose of Jesus. Next, we see the person of Jesus. Verse 23 says, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. So we have to ask the question, okay, Mary's pregnant. She's got a baby. And his name's going to be Jesus. He's the Messiah. But what makes him special? What separates him from any other baby that's ever lived? What's the difference? How do I know this is something spectacular? How? Because he's God. That's what makes him different. Jesus is God in the flesh. Joseph, you know the scriptures. You know the word of the Lord. It said this day would come, and now it's finally here. God has come down. This child is the very uh, son of God. This child is God. And you need to understand that. Why the virgin birth? God, explain that to me. What, what is the significance of the virgin birth? Joseph, I'm glad you asked. Let me explain it. The birth of God's son required a miracle. Listen to this. It required a miracle. He could not be born through the natural process as other men. If he were, then he would be considered nothing more than a mere man. Something had to be different. And so it had to be a virgin 
Not only that, the birth of God's son required a combined act of God's part and on man's part. More specifically, on Mary's part. If God's son were to become a man and identify with men, he had to come through the process of conception so that he could be fully man. On the other side, he could not be born naturally by a man and a woman. Otherwise, he would have taken on the sin nature of mankind inherited and passed down from one man to the next and from one generation to the next. So there had to be an intervention. Therefore, if God willed to send his son world as a man, he would have to perform a miracle causing a woman to be pregnant as a virgin. So there would be no confusion whatsoever that this child was of God. This is the Son of God. The birth of God's Son required a miraculous nature. Nobody else in the existence of creation was fully man and fully God. But Jesus was. He took on the nature of man through Mary. He took on the nature of God through God or not took on. He maintained his nature of God through God. And so he was the only one. And that is why he is able to do what he did. And so Joseph needed to understand all your ancestors, all your ancestors look forward to this day. All of them did what they did, made the sacrifices that they made, believed in the promises of God, All of them acted in obedience for this very moment for the Messiah to come. Looking forward to the promise of salvation. He is God with us. God has looked down, Joseph. And God has seen the burdens of his people. He hears them cry out in agony and pain. They're suffering. They need something better. They need something more. And I come to give them that. I'm going to show them what righteousness looks like. I'm going to live it out right in front of them. Jesus will be God in the flesh. And so after we see the purpose and the person, we finally see the presence of Jesus. The presence. Matthew 120, I love this verse. While he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David... Don't be afraid to take to you, Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is the Holy Spirit. In other words, the angel says, Joseph, this whole thing, (laughs) this is of God. This is of God. Mary has not been unfaithful to you. Mary loves you. And I know you're really struggling with this whole concept of what's taking place. I know, naturally speaking, it does not make sense, and you can't explain it. No man can. This has never happened before, and this will never happen again. This is a unique time in history, but I'm doing this. This is of God. This is all part of God's plan. Verse 22 said, so all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. He says, Joseph, this is all a part of God's plan. This is the Messiah. And that child that Mary is carrying is not the result of sin. Mary has not sinned against you or against me. Matter of fact, her faithfulness to me and you is why she was chosen to do this. That child is not a result of sin. It is the result of salvation. It is time for my promise to be fulfilled. It is time for these things to come to pass. My word has not changed and my purpose for you has not changed. And Joseph, if you don't hear anything else, I need you to understand this. I chose you. I could have chosen anybody else. I chose Mary And I chose you. (laughs) That's the question that we've got to wrestle with today. Have you felt the conviction of God upon you? If you have, you know why? Because God chose you. God chose you. God chose mankind. 
And he sent Jesus to die on the cross so that we could be saved. And we have to wrestle with the same thing that Joseph had to wrestle with. Is will I receive God's hand on my life? Will I accept the fact that God loved me that much? Will I give my life to him? Will I sacrifice everything else so that I can completely devote myself to Jesus 100%? Are you willing to do that? Have you done that? I chose Mary to be the one to bring Jesus into this world. And Joseph, I chose you to be the father, the worldly father of this son and to raise him and to teach him. And so I chose you. We must take a good, long, honest look at ourselves in the mirror, every one of us, and ask that question, are we truly willing to give ourselves to God? Joseph, that's why Mary's pregnant. (laughs) She's pregnant to fulfill the word concerning the Messiah. She's pregnant because he's God. She's pregnant because mankind needs a Savior. She's pregnant because God loves his people. Once Joseph heard the testimony of Jesus, it says in verse 24, Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took to him His wife. But he did not know her until she had brought forth her firstborn son, and they called his name Jesus. Joseph answered, Yes. God, I'll do it. God, I believe it. I'll receive this promise. I'll receive your hand on my life. After hearing the testimony of Jesus, Joseph decided to go with him. The beautiful thing about this is, is when we see the testimony of Jesus, we see that we're a part of his testimony. Everything Jesus did was for us. Everything Jesus decided to do was with you in mind. When he came to this world, it was because he loved you and he saw your need for salvation. When he went to the cross, it was because he loved you and he saw the need for your salvation and mine and everybody's. Everything he did, he did with us in mind. We're a part of his testimony. The testimony of Jesus can change your life. The question is, are you ready to receive that? Are you ready to believe that? You are a part of his testimony, but will he be a part of yours? Will he be a part of yours? I'm going to ask Brother Tony to come. God's told me to hush. I know it's short and sweet today. As he comes, I want you to wrestle with that question. Is Jesus a part of your testimony? When you tell your story, do you talk about Jesus? If not, I know he sure would like for you to. Come on, brother. Would you stand with us this morning? Thank you for joining with Allen's Baptist Church in our worship service today. I'd like to equip you with a few final things before you go. First and foremost, if the Lord has convicted you for any reason through this message, let me urge you to spend the next few moments in prayer. Regardless of the conviction, he is knocking at your heart's door right now, and there is no better time to let him in than the present. If you have acknowledged Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior today in prayer, we are so happy for you. Remember that salvation is only the beginning of a Christian's journey with God. We would love to be a part of helping you figure out what this new life in Christ means and what that looks like for you moving forward. The screen immediately following this video will have the church's phone number, mailing address, email address, and website posted for you. You can also message us on Facebook as well. If you have acknowledged Jesus as your Lord and Savior, have a prayer request, or would simply like to know more about Allen's Baptist Church and its ministries, please contact us. We would love to get to know you, pray for you, and serve alongside you. We look forward to hearing from you soon. God bless.